Solomon chapter 6, 1 Peter, and then the Proverbs. I'm going to pray for us before we get started. Lord, thank you for tonight, and thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, to just worship you and be in fellowship with other believers, to gather with your saints, Lord. And as we open your word, Lord, we pray and ask that your Holy Spirit would, would teach us and instruct us out of your word. Lord, we always, as always, Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to what you have to say to us in your word. And I pray that your spirit be upon me to teach your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, remember the Song of Solomon, uh, it gives us very practical instructions about uh, love and romance in a godly marriage. And in our last study last week, uh, Solomon and his wife got into a fight. They got into a spat, uh, if you remember that. Um, and as we studied through that, we learned a lot about how to resolve conflict in a marriage. Uh, we learned a lot about the, the wrong way 
to resolve conflict and the right way to resolve <coughs> conflict in the marriage. And then we saw at the end of chapter 5, during, during their conflict, uh, that Solomon's bride, the Shulamite woman, she drew her strength from remembering the good attributes of Solomon. She remembered uh, the things about Solomon that she fell in love with. She didn't focus on uh, what he was doing in the conflict, what he was doing wrong, uh, but she focused on the things that she loved about him, uh, the things that, uh, that made her want to marry that guy, the things that were right about him, not the things that were wrong about him. Um, and then we saw in the first three verses of chapter 6 uh, that Solomon and his bride, they resolved their conflict, they were reunited, they reaffirmed their commitment to one another. Um, and that brings us to verse 4 tonight, where we left off last time. Uh, and here, beginning in verse 4, all the way down to chapter 7, verse 9, Solomon declares his love and appreciation for his wife. Uh, he expresses to his wife what he loves about her. Now uh, look at verse 4. Oh my love, you are as beautiful as Terza, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Now he, he compares his wife to the city of Tursa and the city of Jerusalem, and then he compares his wife to an army. Uh, and that, of course, that sounds kind of unflattering uh, to all to us, maybe even insulting. Uh, but it, it's important for us to understand that the Hebrew language is much more poetic, it's much more artistic, it's much more figurative uh, than the English language. Uh, the English language is, is, you know, more mathematical, more linear, more literal, uh, but the Hebrew language is, is poetic. It's painting a picture. And so in verse 4, Solomon compares his wife's beauty to the city of Tursa. Uh, Tursa was a city uh, in the central hill country of Samaria, and in the ancient world, Tursa was known for its natural beauty. And so he, he, he compares her beauty to, you know, he's, he's complimenting her for her natural beauty. Uh, the city of Tursa, it sat in a valley between two mountain ranges. And it kind of, it was just this beautiful, fertile valley, very green, uh, kind of in between these barren mountain ranges on each side of the valley. And so you can imagine someone who's traveling, you know, they're traveling on foot as they would be in that day, traveling over those mountains, and you can picture them kind of coming the, over the crest of the mountain, and then there before their eyes, they see this big, beautiful valley. And in that valley, the city of Tursa. And it would have been you know, breathtaking. They would have stopped in their tracks to just take in the view. And that's how Solomon describes her, her beauty. It stops him in his tracks. It's breathtaking. It's captivating to look at her. And he says that she is as lovely as, as Jerusalem. Now, those of you that went to Jerusalem on our trip, or you went before, uh, you, you may remember the first time you saw Jerusalem. And for us, I know we were on the, on the bus, we kind of came through that tunnel, if you remember, and as you come around the bend, and all of a sudden, boom, Jerusalem appears on your left-hand side, and there's the city. And you get your first glimpse of the city, and then more mountains go by, and, you, and so you just see it for a, a second or two, and then it and then you don't see it again. But that first moment where it just, it, it, it grabs you to see the city, to see the skyline. And that's what he's describing here when he talks about how lovely she is. She's as lovely as Jerusalem. You know, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I saw you. 
You know, in the Psalms, in Psalm 48, verse 2, there it says, Jerusalem is beautifully situated, and it's the joy of the whole earth. In Psalm 50, verse 2, it says, Jerusalem is the perfection of beauty, and for Solomon, his wife's beauty was perfect. His wife's beauty was his, his joy, just like the perfection of Jerusalem. The beauty of Jerusalem is his wife's beauty. And he says her beauty is as awesome as an army with, with banners. Again, you have to imagine what that would look like. You know, imagine the, you know, the, the, this, this awesome, majestic uh, sight of a huge army marching off to war. And the way he would feel seeing that sight. That's the way she makes him feel. Um, Julia Ward Howe wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic. You know that song, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, right? She wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic after watching Union soldiers march off to battle in Northern Virginia. And she went back to her hotel room at the Willard in Washington, D.C., and wrote down the words to the battle hymn of the Republic. Because of what she saw, seeing this army marching up to war. And, and that, that's how Solomon felt when he saw his, his bride. When he looked at her, he heard the battle hymn of the Republic. And just, glory, glory, hallelujah. You know, just her beauty was so wonderful and so majestic. And look at verse 5. Solomon says, Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. And he says, just, just one look from you overcomes me or, or overwhelms me. He said a similar thing back in chapter 4. If you turn back to chapter 4, verse 9. And there he said, uh, You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes. Just one look. Just one look my way and, and my heart melts. Now, he, now here in verse 5 down to verse 7, Solomon repeats what he said to her back in chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. He, he says the same things to her, the exact same things to her, as he said back in, in chapter 4, as he's describing her beauty. He uses the same description. And, and we read chapter 6, verses 5 to 7, and, and we might think, well, well, can't Solomon come up with something new to say to his wife? Did he forget that he already told his wife these things? As sometimes we do. <clears throat> but in, in Hebrew poetry, which this is Hebrew poetry, in Hebrew poetry, repetition is important. Solomon repeats himself here deliberately. He repeats himself on purpose. And by repeating the same description to his wife, Solomon is emphasizing that these are the things that he finds attractive about her. Uh, these are the things that just, that, you know, just melt him. And she knows it. Because he's repeated it to her. You know, she can tell you what it is about her that her husband loves. He says in verse 5 again, Turn your eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. Remember when we went through this in chapter 4, we talked about how the goats would kind of stream down, or, or kind of flow down the mountains there in Israel, and he describes her hair that way, that her hair just kind of flows down her cheeks and down to her shoulders. He says in verse 6, your teeth are like a flock of sheep which have come up from washing. Everyone bears twins, and none is barren among them. Her teeth are white, and she's not missing any teeth. Remember we talked about that? This was in a time, of course, when there were no dentists and no toothpaste and no fluoride treatments. So it was very unusual to find a woman with all of her teeth. 
And what he's saying here is you, you have a rare beauty. I've never seen a woman as beautiful as you. Like a piece of pomegranate are your temples or your cheeks. Speaking of her complexion here, behind your, your veil. So these are all the same things that Solomon said to his, his wife back in chapter 4. But when he said them to her back in chapter 4, that was when they first fell in love. And now they're married. And now they've been together for a while. And Solomon still feels the same way about his wife. He's still just as in love with her as he was when they were first dating and they were first in love with each other. He still feels the same. And he tells her. He tells her again and again. It's, it's good for us to regularly uh, and repeatedly express our love and admiration to our spouse. It's good. Wives, compliment your husband often. <coughs> Tell him the things that you love and admire about him. Compliment his looks. Tell him that he looks good and be specific. Husbands, remind your wives often of how beautiful she is to you. How much you appreciate her. Be specific. Solomon was specific. And, and don't, don't, don't think, well, she knows. She knows how much I love her. I, I don't need to tell her. I mean, she knows. I've told her. She knows. No. Tell her. And tell her often. Just like Solomon does. That's just what a godly man does. Now look at verse 8. Solomon here, he says there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one for me. The only one of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The daughter saw her and called her blessed the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Who is she who looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome as an army with banners? Uh, Solomon tells her back in verse 8, he tells his wife, I would pick you over any other woman. If I had my choice of any woman, I would pick you. And he says here, I would pick you over 60 queens and 80 concubines and countless virgins or young unmarried women. Now what, what does Solomon mean by that? Well, queens were rich and powerful. Concubines were strictly for physical pleasure. Virgins were young, unmarried women. And Solomon mentions these three, and he assures his wife so that she feels secure in their marriage, and his wife doesn't fear that her husband might leave her for, for someone who's rich and powerful, for someone who is more successful. You know, she, she doesn't fear that, uh, that, to put it kind of in today's terminology, she doesn't fear that he's going to leave her for some, you know, co-worker. You know, this some professional that, that he works with, the successful professional, you know, while she's at home taking care of the kids and changing diapers and, you know, in her yoga pants with her hair in a ponytail all day, and he's at work with these beautiful professional women. She doesn't worry about that. She doesn't, she doesn't fear that he'll get involved physically with a woman and leave her, like a concubine. She doesn't fear that he might leave her for some younger, more attractive woman. She knows that he is crazy about her, and she can trust him. And she knows that there's no competition. 
he, he doesn't allow competition into his heart, uh, and the, there, there's no competition. As his wife, she knows there's no competition with her husband. I think it's, that's important that, you know, husbands, that we, we make our wives feel secure in our love, and that our wives know there's, there's nothing competing. There's no other woman competing for our heart. Now, so, some of you might be thinking to yourselves, wait a minute, this is Solomon. Solomon ended up with 700 wives and, and 300 concubines, and, and that's true. Something changed in this marriage. Something changed in this marriage, and, and we don't know what the Bible doesn't tell us. But at, at this point, he is crazy in love with his wife, and then something changes where the, the, the passion dies, the romance dies, and, and Solomon permitted other women to compete with his wife in his heart for his affection, for his devotion. And one of the lessons that we learn from Solomon is that we, we have to keep feeding the fire in our marriage. We have to keep that, that nurturing the romance in our marriage. And we have to keep the competition out. Something takes place in Solomon's life where he goes from, from this, where he's telling his wife all of this flowery love, you know, language to her, to where he ends up getting married 700 times. It's 300 concubines. And notice what he says here in verse 9. Solomon calls her, my perfect one. My perfect one. And that, that speaks of her moral virtue. Solomon not only loves her outward beauty, but her inward beauty as well, her inward virtue. The Shulamite woman is a virtuous uh, woman. And remember, Proverbs 31 tells us about the virtuous wife. And do you remember who wrote Proverbs 31? Solomon's mother. Solomon's mother. Solomon's mother instructed him about the virtuous wife and the kind of wife you should look for. And Solomon found that virtuous wife and he admires her, her virtue, this, this inward beauty that she has. Turn with me over to 1 Peter chapter 3. Keeping your finger here, 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter chapter 3, here Peter speaks to wives, and he says in verse 3, do not let your adornment be mer merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Let, rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of of God. So Peter says to wives, don't, don't only focus on your outward appearance or your outward beauty, but focus also on your, your inward beauty, your inward godliness, your inward virtue. And he says here in verse 4, I don't know if you caught it, he refers to the inward beauty as incorruptible beauty. Meaning the outward beauty is corruptible. Outward beauty fades over time. But the inward beauty grows more and more beautiful over time. And, and so he says here, don't only focus on the outward. Focus on the inward. And, and back in the Song of Solomon, Solomon has a wife who has this uh, inward beauty. She's virtuous. And Solomon complimented his wife both on her outward beauty and her inward, in her inward beauty. Her inward, her inward virtue. Husbands, do 
Do you compliment your wife on her inward beauty? Do you compliment your wife on, um, on her relationship with the Lord? Do you tell her how much you appreciate her love for Jesus Christ? How much you appreciate her love for the Lord, her love for His Word, her heart for the things of God? Don't just compliment her on her outward beauty, but compliment her on her inward beauty as well. And, and, and look what happens here. Solomon says all of these things to his wife. He praises her wife for her outward beauty and her inward beauty. And then verse 11, I went down to the garden of nuts to see the verdure of the valley to see whether the vine had budded and the pomegranates had bloomed. And, and here, remember, the garden was a symbol of their intimacy together. This, this, this creates more, more romance. It creates more love for each other. The way that he speaks to his wife, the way that he praises her, it, it creates more romance to blossom. And then she says, look at verse 12. She says, before I was even aware, my soul had made me as the chariots of my noble people. Meaning she, she feels like she is a noble person riding in a chariot. She feels like royalty is the idea. Why? Because of the words of love and admiration that her husband said to her and expressed to her. And she says here in verse 12, she says, Before I was even aware I felt this way. Before I even knew it. Before I realized it. It was, it was sudden. It came over me. I felt like royalty. In other words, uh, Solomon swept her off her feet. With his compliments and his admiration of her. Isn't that great? How, how because he speaks words of love and admiration to her, how, how it affects her and how it, it, it lifts her spirit and how it makes her feel about herself because of the words of life that her husband spoke to her. Husbands, have you ever just uh, dropped a compliment on your wife for no reason at all? Not because she like made dinner for you or whatever, but just like just in the middle of the day, just you know what I love about you? And just drop a compliment on her. And when you do that, sometimes, you know, it's so unexpected. She's not expecting it. I, I, today my wife was uh, she, we had a bunch of flowers that were donated to the church, and she was sitting, standing at the kitchen seat trimming flowers. And I just I, I was reading this and I complimented her. She said, oh, really? You really think that about me? It just immediately, her countenance lifted, just for that simple compliment. Solomon's words made his wife feel special and esteemed. And it made her feel better about herself. Godly men build up their wives with their words. They don't tear their wives down. They build up their wives. And Solomon expressed his love with words in such a way that it made his wife feel like royalty by the way that he affirmed her. Now, verse 13. Here's where it gets kind of interesting here. Verse 13. Now remember that the Song of Solomon, it, it's a song. It's the Song of Songs. It's Solomon's greatest hit. And so, so far we've heard, if you remember, we've heard from three singers. There's been three singers in this song. There's been Solomon. There's been his wife, the Shulamite woman. And then there has been her girlfriends called the Daughters of Jerusalem. And verse 13 introduces a fourth voice into this song now, for the first time, we hear this fourth voice 
in the song. And in verse 13, the friends of Solomon speak. So they join in now. So these are the friends of Solomon now, speaking in verse 13. And they say, return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. So these are Solomon's friends. These are Solomon's buddies. And they say to his wife, not to Solomon, but to Solomon's wife, they speak to her directly, and they say, come back, come back, that we may look upon you. If you're a note taker, that phrase, look upon you, it, it means to, to gaze upon to look upon longingly. Solomon's buddies here want to check out his wife. They want to check her out. And they go to her, you know, they send her a text. And they tell her that they want to check her out. And it's Solomon who responds. Verse 13, Solomon now says, What would you see in the Shulamite? As it were the dance of the two camps. Solomon says to his buddies, What do you mean you want to check out my wife? What do you mean you want to look on her? Now there's a lot of, a lot of applications for this that we can draw from this. I just want to point out a few of them. Uh, first of all, and th this, this is directed kind of more towards the men here, but it, it applies to both men and women. Um, we, we should never comment to another man's wife in an inappropriate way. Or if you're a woman, you should never comment to another woman's husband in an inappropriate way. You should never say something to another man's wife that has any kind of innuendo. Even if it's just a joke. Even if you're good friends with that couple, and you've got history with that couple, it's never appropriate. It's never appropriate to talk to another man's wife in an inappropriate way, with any kind of innuendo. That's one thing. In fact, I, I, would, I would add to that uh, that you should have very, as a man, and again, it goes both ways, it applies to women too, but as a man, you should have very little communication with another man's wife unless it's just, it's necessary. You can have necessary communication, but you should have very little communication beyond that for it to be appropriate. I typically, when I send a text to a woman, I'll copy my wife on the text, even if it doesn't have anything to do with her. Or if she sends a text to a man for some reason with the church or something like that, she'll copy me on the text. Or she'll copy me on the email. I'll copy her on the email. Or I'll say, I just sent a text to so-and-so about such-and-such. In case she looks on my phone and sees, uh, you know, some text messages on there to another woman. Or I look on her phone and I see text messages on there to another man. Some of you remember a few years ago, uh, some of the ladies in the church planned a surprise party, 40th birthday party, for my wife. And that is the only time in my marriage that I had secret texts with other women uh, planning that thing and coordinating that thing to get my wife there. And it was gut-wrenching for me. In fact, I, had to, I think I told Sarah Sparks, if I drop dead between now and my wife's birthday party, you need to tell my wife why I have all these text messages on my phone when she sees it. But you, you really shouldn't need to have communication with someone else's wife. And, and here, you see Solomon as the husband now. 
he's responding to these guys talking to his wife like this. If you want to turn with me over to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 34. For jealousy is a husband's fury. Therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. Jealousy is a husband's fury. If, if you talk to another man's wife, if you say something inappropriate to her, off color, or something with some kind of innuendo, you kind of cross a line in some way with another man's right, wife, you're inviting that husband's fury. You're inviting that husband's fury. You say anything to his wife or about his wife, something inappropriate, if you badmouth her in some way, you're inviting his fury. If you're married, it's, a, it's just a good idea. And again, this goes for both men and women, husbands and wives, to have just safe boundaries for yourself with members of the opposite sex, whether they're married or single, doesn't matter, just for the sake of your marriage and for the protection of your marriage. And I want you to notice here, when these guys say something to Solomon's wife, it's Solomon who comes to the defense of his wife, and Solomon protects his wife's honor. He doesn't allow it. He doesn't allow men to talk to his wife in an inappropriate way. A godly man does not allow others to speak disrespectfully about his wife. He doesn't allow his friends to speak to his wife inappropriately or speak about his wife inappropriately. He doesn't allow his buddies to badmouth his wife. You know, where he doesn't allow his friends to say, your wife's such a ball and chain. You know, she doesn't let you have any fun. I don't see how you can stand to be married to her. A godly man does not tolerate anyone speaking against his wife in that way. And a godly man will end that friendship. doesn't matter how long that friendship has been in place. doesn't matter how long you've known that person. A godly man will end that friendship to honor his wife. A godly man will not say, well, I've known them longer than I've known you. No, that's an ungodly man that would say something like that. But Solomon here, he defends his wife, and, and he, on, he defends the honor of his wife and again, this is something that goes both ways. A godly wife does not allow her friends to badmouth her husband. A godly wife does not allow her friends to say, Man, he's such, he's such a jerk. He's so mean to you. And I don't know how you put up with him. I don't know how you put up with this nonsense. My point is you always protect the honor of your spouse. When you, when you got married, you stood up in front of God and your family and friends and you made a covenant with that person <laughs> and with God. And part of that covenant is forsaking all others. I'm putting you first in my life. And, and I've seen marriages, and you probably have seen marriages too, where the greatest threat to that marriage is the husband's buddies or the, or the wife's girlfriends. And it's the friends that are causing division and tension in the marriage because the husband will not stand up and defend the honor of his wife or the wife will not defend the honor of her husband. And you just, you have to protect the honor of your spouse. Another way that this can happen in a marriage is with the children. I've seen that too where the children are permitted to badmouth one of the parents to the other parent. Husbands, never allow your children to badmouth your wife, their mother. 
And wives, never allow your children to badmouth your husband. And husbands, never allow your children to disrespect your wife. And I would say, especially if you have sons. Especially if you have sons. Because your sons are going to have trouble coming under their mom's authority anyways. Because they're boys. Don't let your sons disrespect your wife. Ever. Just don't tolerate it. Don't allow your children to speak disrespectfully or dishonoring in any way. Even, listen, even if what they say is, is true, don't allow it. And don't, don't, don't agree with them. Don't say, yeah, he, he's, he's, that's just how your dad is. Or, She's always been that way. Just don't, don't allow it. You remember back in chapter 2, verse 15. There in chapter 2, verse 15, it said, The little foxes destroy the vineyard. Allowing someone to speak inappropriately, inappropriately to your spouse or about your spouse can be the little fox that destroys your marriage relationship. So, I'll get off my soapbox now. Chapter 7, verse 1. Now in chapter 7, Solomon describes his wife's beauty, and he describes her beauty from her feet to her head. But back in chapter 4, he described her beauty from her head to her toes, and now he's describing her beauty from her toes to her head. This guy's got a bag for her. He says, how beautiful are your feet and sandals, O prince's daughter. He, he, he even thinks her feet are beautiful. <laughs> now here the, the word feet is referring to, to her walk. The way she walks or the way she moves is beautiful to Solomon. Solomon is, is looking at his wife walk into the room and he's, he's thinking of the Beatles song, Something in the Way She Moves. Right? Just something in the way she moves as she comes into the room. The curves of your thighs are like jewels. The work of the hands of a skillful workman. Your navel is a rounded goblet. It lacks no blended beverage. Your waist is a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Remember, he said these things to her once before. Again, that repetition is showing that these are the things that he really <coughs> loves about her. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Earlier he said it was like the Tower of David. Your eyes are like the pool's of Heshbon, by the gate of Bath Rabbim. You know, it's, it's interesting in the, in the Bible, there's, there's thousands of geographic references in the Bible. And the writer of the Bible, of course, they're, they're writing to people living in that day, and the people living in that day know exactly what he's talking about when he mentions the pools of Heshbon at the gates of Bath Rabbim. You know, just as a side note, you know, um, the Bible is the, is the only religious book that has geography in it the way that it does. You know, the Quran has very limit, limited geogra geography references in it. No other religious writings have the geographical references of, you know, this, this is where God did this, in this place. Only the Bible has that. No other religious writings have it. Most religious writings are just... Uh, religious platitudes and instruction on how you should live. But the Bible is the story of God coming down and working in the lives of men in a real geographical location. You see that reference thousands of times. Here your eyes are like the pools of, uh, of Heshbon. Heshbon had these, these giant um, cisterns that were carved and hewn out of the rock there. So your eyes are like these deep cisterns. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon. Again, he's, he's not 
He's not saying she's got a big nose or a really tall nose. That's how we would read it. The Tower of Lebanon, it sat atop the mountains of Lebanon. Uh, Mount Hermon in Israel is part of the mountains of Lebanon. And in the Tower of Lebanon, you had this incredible, breathtaking view of, of the uh, valley and of the expanse leading towards Damascus. So the idea is it's, it's, it's breathtaking. This guy's in love with her nose. Man, I could just look at your nose all day long. It's mesmerizing. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which looks toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. You guys remember, those of you that went before, standing on Mount Carmel, do you remember what the view was like? Looking out over the Jezreel Valley. Breathtaking. Stunning. Remember that? Remember standing up on that platform, looking out over that valley, and just, man, just amazing. You can see all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. It's beautiful. That's what he's saying about her face. Your, your, your face is stunning, breathtaking. And the hair of your head is, is like purple. A king is held captive by your tresses. And he's not saying her hair is purple. He's saying your head is, is your, your hair is like purple. Purple was uh, this, this dye that they extracted from uh, mollusks out of the Mediterranean Sea. It was very, very um, laborious to, to get that dye. It was very, very expensive. It was very luxurious. He's saying your hair is so luxurious. Captivated. How fair and how pleasant you are, O oh love, with your delights. This stature of yours is like a palm tree, and your breast like its cluster, speaking of the date palms. I said I will go up to the palm tree, I will take hold of its branches. Now, if you know anything about palm trees, the branches are up at the top, right? And these date palms are huge, they're ginormous. And what he's saying here is, I, I, I would do anything for your love. All right, even if I got to climb a date palm for your love. Let now your breasts be like clusters of the vine. The fragrance of your breath is like apples, which I guess was a, an attractive thing uh, in that time to have your breath smell like apples. You know, my wife made a whole bunch of apple cider today. Uh, she cooked down these apples and made apple cider. So her breath smelled like apples today. I complimented her on that. <laughs> and the roof of your mouth is like the best wine. I'm talking about kissing her. The wine goes down smoothly for my beloved. Moving gently the lips of sleepers. Solomon here, he delights in his wife. Just delights in her. And Solomon is satisfied with his wife. He finds his satisfaction in her. If you turn with me over to um, Proverbs uh, chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. And here remember in Proverbs, Solomon is writing to his, his young son who's entering into adulthood. And he's sharing wisdom with his young son about life and the things that he's going to face in life. And here in chapter 5, he's talking to his wife about Love and marriage and the, the pitfalls uh, that could come into a young man's life when it comes to love and marriage. And he says to his son in chapter 5, verse 18, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth as a loving deer and a 
graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times, and always be enraptured with her love. And Solomon was. Solomon was enraptured with his wife's love. He found his satisfaction in her. He rejoiced in the wife of his youth. A godly man finds all, all his satisfaction in his wife. He's enraptured with her love. And he's not, he's not looking to satisfy that anywhere else. He's not looking at to satisfy it with another woman. He's not looking on the internet to satisfy it. He has all of that just satisfied in, in her. And Solomon's wife, Solomon's wife knows that her husband is satisfied with her and fulfilled with her love. And you know how he knows? Because he tells her. He tells her. Solomon tells his wife that he's satisfied with her. And again, husbands, tell your wife that she satisfies you, that you're fulfilled in your marriage with her. Tell her to remove any and all doubt from her mind. Solomon told his wife. And that made her secure and safe in the marriage. And we'll stop there for tonight. We'll pick it up again next time. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for these verses. And Lord, help us to be uh, godly husbands and godly wives. Help us to uh, love our wives love our husbands the way that uh, you instruct us to in your word. And Lord, pray for those that are single, Lord, as we go through this, that they see uh, the type of husband or wife they should be and the type of husband or wife they should look for. Lord, I pray that you would be with us for the remainder of our week and our weekend ahead. I pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit and that we would walk closely with you pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, God.